Remnant from the Ashes is a Souls-like third-person shooter with the difficulty, the rolling, the four quick items, bonfire checkpoints and whatnot that's reminiscent of Dark Souls. The similarities are pretty evident, so calling Remnant Dark Souls with guns isn't wrong. It's a good way to pitch it, although there is more to it than that. Remnant has its own personality, and it's a bit less hardcore. For starters, it's less demanding with stamina since it's only used by running and dodging, while melee strikes only halt your stamina regeneration. Gameplay is simple enough in concept. You go through a map, taking out monsters as you see fit, until you reach an exit and then you do the same in the next map, from time to time facing off against a boss. Maps aren't completely linear though, there's often detours that can lead to optional areas where you may find items or more enemies and boss battles. There are also random events that you might run across during your journey, helping living it up a bit. Scattered throughout the maps are checkpoints that replenish your ammo, health and skills. The game is generous with them, I don't remember ever feeling I was going on too long without one, so if I died in the middle of a dungeon I felt it, but it wasn't so bad and I could quickly redo the lost progress. But I gotta say, that white sign effect they use whenever you touch a crystal, I did get used to it eventually, but it's kind of annoying to the eyes. Checkpoints also allow you to teleport, giving you the chance to return to base where you can buy consumables, upgrade your gear and sometimes buy new equipment. All of this requires different materials you get as you play. You can get a lot from killing enemies, breaking stuff or just picking what's been left behind. So farming basic stuff is not such a chore until you're trying to max out everything. On the other hand, the materials for creating guns will only be dropped by a boss in particular, with some of them requiring specific conditions to be met. This way, every time you take down a new boss you'll be rewarded with a new weapon or modifier for your guns, which is a great incentive to find and defeat new bosses. Also giving a good feeling of progression as each battle you win means a new tool in your arsenal. As long as you go to the shop and buy it, that is. There's a good variety of weapons, including the option to forego them and just punch and kick, which is funny, but I wouldn't recommend it. The problem arises when you want to get a specific thing, as some of the bosses are not guaranteed to appear during your campaign. The game has some level of procedural generation. Playing two different campaigns may have you find different battles and areas, which adds replay value but makes getting what you want a matter of luck at times. They do try mitigating this problem. You can join another player's campaign to save yourself the time it takes to start a new one and get to the zone you want to redo. And if your team's already full or you don't want to play with other people, there's Adventure Mode. Adventure Mode lets you set up a quick playthrough in one of the different zones of the game, with a few bosses and a chance at all the events and sub-areas you'd get in that zone. It's a very good feature, although it obviously doesn't guarantee anything. In one campaign I was doing solo, I reached this area on my first run and got this funny monkey key which allowed me to get a new weapon. But while using a different character and playing with friends who also didn't have the key, we pulled several runs through adventure mode and while we got to the area twice, neither time they didn't have the key or the door to unlock with it. I'm not going to give too much flack to the game for this as it's an unavoidable part of procedural generation. If you were always given the gear, then it wouldn't be really random. However, it certainly can get annoying and it's not just a matter of getting loot. If you really like a stage or a boss battle that only has a chance to appear and want to play it again, then it's up to your luck, so you'll maybe have to give it a few tries or more to replay them, even if it's just for fun. That's a shame because the bosses for the most part I found to be entertaining and I would've liked a way to get rematch without all the complications. Maybe a boss mode where you can refight the ones you already beat in adventure and campaign and you can make it so they don't drop items if that's a problem. This replay and farming issue becomes worse with the Swamps of Corsus, an area you cannot play in adventure mode unless you have a DLC, meaning if you want to go at these bosses and you don't want to join another player's game, you've gotta do the entire campaign again, and this is not an early game zone, so it's a bit of a trick to get back in there. I know this is nothing strange for a video game, but the difference Remnant has with most video games that don't let you replay specific parts is that it's autosave only due to how it works, so you can't keep a save file before the parts you like. Going back to the subject of gear, the other side of character builds are the traits you increase with your levels. To bring back comparisons to Dark Souls, here you don't need to interact with a checkpoint or a particular NPC, and you don't increase any of your stats when you do. Instead, every time you rank up, you obtain a point you can use at any moment on one of the traits you have available. Traits give buffs to different aspects of your character such as health, 
reload speed or critical chance. Most of them don't give that big an increase per level, but if you max them out they can make a difference. With a few exceptions I just don't see worth upgrading. The traits are obtained in different ways. For example, if you vault over objects enough times, you get a trait to buff climbing speed. And reviving enough allies gives you a trait to revive them faster. Bosses and events give traits too. And there's three particular ones that are given to you by free depending on your starting archetype. That leads us to the classes of the game. There are none. Instead, you're asked to pick one of three archetypes when you create a character. The only difference is your starting gear and traits, but you can obtain everything from the other archetypes with a bit of effort. Especially the gear which you can just buy from the start at a reasonable price. The little push you get might be important in higher difficulties, but in normal it's not a big deal. Over time all players will be able to do the same things and have the same options for gameplay. And believe me, there are plenty. Want to snipe bad guys from afar? Sure, you can do that. Want to get close and personal with your shotgun and melee? Of course, go ahead. Maybe you prefer wrecking havoc with status effects, or be sneaky and take out unaware foes, or just go nuts and body slam enemies to death. Any build is possible, provided you put the effort to make it. I haven't gotten super in depth myself, but I've seen discussions and videos of it and I can confirm there's potential for some interesting stuff. If you're into creating builds, this game will probably appeal to you. That said, if you're playing alone, many people would recommend you pick the Excultists on your first playthrough, including me, as it provides you with a spirit trait, which increases the recharge speed of your mods, or in other words, your active skills. You could get it from a random event like the other two traits given to the archetypes, but that's a matter of luck, and I've already explained what problem that can bring. Of course, it's just a recommendation, you can do whatever you like, cause in the end that's part of the fun in this game. And you know what else is fun? The multiplayer. Multiplayer is only co-op, that means no surprise visitors invading your game to pick a fight with you or vice versa. Up to 3 people are allowed together so you and two friends can go through the entire game as a team. With friends you benefit from greater numbers and the ability to rescue each other from certain death, unlike single player. The way the game balances this is interesting, however. Reanimating an ally costs you a dragon heart, a special rechargeable item normally used to self-heal fast. This method makes it so you're not just limiting the amount of times you can revive, but also means each time a party member goes down, another one will have to sacrifice a chance to heal quickly. This causes any following battle to be a bit more punishing, and makes getting extra hearts all the more valuable. On the subject of balancing things, enemies get stronger and come in greater numbers in multiplayer, which on the bright side means more experience. For most items, what one person gets, everybody obtains. If somebody else takes materials, consumables or scraps from the floor, you get your own too, even if you're at the other end of the map. The same way, when I killed this boss and got this seed, my friends obtained one too. The only exceptions to this rule are ammunition, since managing ammo is an important part of the game, and experience to a certain extent. Experience does get shared, but only if the players that haven't done the kill are close enough to the one who did. You can increase the range with a special trait called teamwork, but I don't think it's necessary, the range is already pretty good. Ultimately, multiplayer is the biggest feature for me. The Souls-like gameplay is fun and mechanically the game is very solid, but getting to do it with your pals obviously multiplies the fun, just the same as with most games. Although there were some issues that only were present while doing co-op. For example, when trying to cross the fog to enter a boss battle, if someone started entering slightly after, he or she would do the animation but stay behind and would need to enter a second time to actually get in. There was also often a visual bug where the waiting for players message would stay on screen until we changed area. Sometimes it went away after getting all on a checkpoint, but not always. And there was a bug I never got myself but my friends told me about, sometimes they'd hear one of the other players make reloading sounds constantly. None of these bugs were more than an annoyance, but they happen often. There were other glitches that were more of a problem, like this one where I was locked into the pause menu. I could still walk, but I couldn't turn, attack or interact with items. It also made it impossible for my team to move to the next area and it only went away after I left the game and came back in. I didn't get to record this glitch since it only happened once and I have no idea what caused it, so it's probably something rare, but it still did happen. The same goes for a glitch where after teleporting I spawned dead, and a glitch where I once spawned dead in the hub but my body was still alive, which got fixed by my friends killing it and touching the crystal. There was also times when players that were in the hose would get kicked for attempting to cheat, 
despite doing nothing to warrant that. What I'm trying to say is that co-op gameplay is still very solid, but it's a bit bumpier than solo. As for story, it also has a small issue, though that's more a matter of design and glitches. There are conversations you can only have once with NPCs. If your player isn't the one participating in it, you'll hear the NPCs worse, but you won't be able to read what dialogue choices a player makes. If you're interested in following that conversation, you better have a friend willing to say them out loud and who doesn't skip the voice lines. Outside these exchanges, there's little story. The plot has humanity against the ropes, with Earth destroyed by a tree-like alien species named the Root that is set on massacring the human race. There was meant to be a hero who would save the day, but he's gone. So it's up to you to go on a journey and find a way to stop these monsters. That's the gist of it, and you'll learn it all in a skippable tutorial you do alone. This is a game that feels like it puts the gameplay first, and the story is more for the sake of context which is a perfectly fine thing to do. However, the ending feels too sudden due to this. I'm not spoiling anything, but the ending is like the game telling you, well, that's it, roll the credits. I'd say Resident Evil 4 and 5 have more complex endings than this game, and that's saying a lot. There is, however, a good amount of lore you can get through details like optional documents in the same vein as those two games. Also, there is some nicely done world building, which I commend the game for. You visit multiple places with their own factions that have their aesthetics and history. The looks of this are very striking and easy to distinguish, even among different members of the same tribe. Thanks to the little bits of lore you're given and what you see, you can get a good idea of the kind of civilization that lived there and what happened to them before you arrived. As for sound design, the voice acting is fine, although of course most of what you hear will be the screams and grunts of the enemies that tend to go unnoticed and all those quips your characters make. That's all you got! Pop off! Eyes on! Might not be over! Ooh. That, that, that was nuts! Uh. The music is good too, although not much of it stood out to me while playing. Maybe it was an issue with my volume or me being too focused on the action to pay attention, but I couldn't recall almost a single melody from the soundtrack, which is a shame because when I listened to some of the battle music by itself, what I heard was pretty high quality. The only two songs I paid attention to while playing were the main theme and the ambience at Ward 13, which being honest are beautiful haunting melodies. Sadly, they never released the soundtrack officially. You can't get an album or listen on Spotify or anything. Instead, people have to make do with recording straight from the game, which they shouldn't have to do. Moving back to gameplay, replayability is an important aspect of it, and the game encourages it with all the variety and the difficulties. There's four modes plus a hardcore option that makes you lose your character if you get a game over, and in exchange, you get unique loot that's shared with every character you create. There's a challenge for everybody, although I found normal mode is already challenging enough on a first run to always keep you on your toes. The only part that was frustrating being Exilus the 15th, it's a very well designed boss, both in visuals and attacks, but most of my deaths were caused by falling off the stage, which quickly got annoying and sour my experience. My team and I did get better with every attempt, until eventually we won, but by that time, rather than enjoying myself, I was thinking, glad we're done with that. Compared to the second hardest boss in our first run, the Thrall, he kicked our asses many times, and whenever I died, it was because he or his minions dropped my HP to zero, rather than falling off. But just the same as Ixilis, we slowly learned to avoid him better and counter him properly. Having that eureka moment where I thought, wait, this gun will work better to deal with Zats? And seeing it pay off was one of the moments I remember the most fondly. In the end, the Thrall was one of my favorite battles partially because of the challenge he posed for us. And since I mentioned the ads, I gotta say that might be a problem with bosses to you. A big chunk of their battles in the base game rely on sending minions at you often swarming you, and it can make the battles feel less about the boss since it's the little guys who cause the most trouble. In normal mode you're a problem, but can be handled. But already on cooperative hard mode, I felt every boss battle could easily go out of control. Don't take that last point as me dissing the boss battles or hard mode, rather take it as a warning of what the latter brings to the fray. You might want to do some farming before jumping from normal to hard. In the end, Remnant is a very good game and I enjoyed it for the most part. If you are a fan of third-person shooters, are looking for a challenge and enjoy creating and testing all sorts of builds, this is a game worth trying, either alone or with friends, as long as you don't mind the lack-related issues I mentioned before. It's available on PC, Xbox One, Xbox Series X, PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 5. 
I can't say what differences there are for sure between each version, though from what I've seen, other than graphics they're the same. So choose whatever you fancy to give the game a try on and who knows, maybe you'll find yourself replaying it once or twice, or maybe a dozen times. Either way, I hope you've enjoyed the video and I hope you also have a very nice day. Goodbye. On another note, does anyone else think Ixelis looks like something out of Hollow Knight?